And let's go ahead and highlight, spotlight some of you. There we go. Okay, folks, uh, we are at 8.31, and so we're going to get started with the Coffee Chats, Tackling Housing Affordability, a Legislative Response, and Business Implications. Uh, I am your host today, Gary Clark, President and CEO of Economic Alliance Nahomish County, and I am pleased to have you join us for another installation of Coffee Chats. I'd like to remind each of you to do the following, which is to make sure you mute yourself as you join us, um, but also that you add your name and your organization that you are a part of in the chat below. And... Uh, in addition to that, I'd like to ask that each of you just uh, ping someone else to join this, this uh, Zoom, and hopefully we can continue to, to engage more people. Uh, additionally, today, we have some amazing panelists joining us, and I'd like to start off with uh, Mayor Hyoko Matsumoto Wright, which is the mayor of the city of Mount Lake Terrace. Mayor Kyoko, thank you for joining us. Thank you for um, inviting me. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, additionally, we have Mr. Mark Smith, Executive Director, Housing Consortium of Everett and Snohomish County. Mark, thank you. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And last but not least, uh, he has joined us a few times over to educate us on uh, our housing issues here in Snohomish County. Uh, with us today is Program Manager of the Housing Authority of Snohomish County, Chris Collier. Chris, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And I promise I have something new for you this morning. All right, all right. And with that said, folks, I'd like to uh, just mention to you all, we'd like to allow for uh, Mayor Matsumoto Wright to start off. Uh, she's going to engage us briefly, and then hopefully uh, we'll go from there to Mr. Smith, and then last but not least, Mr. Collier, and then we'll have some uh, some conversation and questions. Mayor, take it away. Thank you. First of all, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, because it says that I'm muted, but I'm not. Mine is green. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this is a huge topic. It's a very, very important topic. We have, wow, two of the, um, well, I, I would say uh, the people in Snohomish County who knows more about affordable housing than anyone else, and that'd be Mark Smith and Chris Collier. Um, but today, um, I'm here to talk about how affordable housing <clears throat> um, affects businesses. And well, if you think about it, it's just a no brainer. Um, if there aren't any housing for people, businesses won't move here. And um, if, because the workers need to find someplace to live that's close by, they're not gonna travel two hours. Um, we need to have better tra uh, transportation systems, um, better housing choices and, um, and then we have to then support all the other businesses that support the big businesses um, and have housing for them too, that's nearby and affordable. <clears throat> um, and how do we do this? And I know that uh, Mark Smith and Chris Collier are gonna talk about some of that, but we really do need to change our way of thinking. Um, today is today, tomorrow is a different story. I have already resigned to the fact that what I want doesn't matter anymore because I'm not gonna be here in 20, 30 years. But the other generation that's below me, my son's generation and everyone, they're gonna be here and they want something different from us. And they're trying to tell us they want something different, but the, the elected officials and others who are in a different um, generation category, they're not listening. So I think we should just start listening to the younger generation. Um, I was asked to talk about 
um, transit oriented developments really fast because Mount Lake Terrace is going to get a light rail station and we are we are working um, for density. And um, we have to prepare for the future. Uh, the future is less cars, but the current residents don't want to believe that. It's so hard to, so we have to change our policies to make it easier to build higher and denser. Mount Lake Terrace, um, we've been working on these changes for a long, long time, not to everyone's liking, but I'm sorry, I have to do things for the future. Um, the tra um, traffic, the traffic is not gonna get any better with um, better, uh, transportation choices. It's just not going to get any worse because there's going to be more people here with more cars and we don't want to add more cars to what is already a heavy, heavy um, freeway system with cars in it. And so we have to add uh, different choices and um, we're all working on those different choices. And I, I just want other people um, like me or our age, my age, to realize that, you know, we didn't like it. Remember when we were teenagers, we didn't like what our past generations did because, um, you know, there were a lot of things that we fought for that we didn't get. Um, and we didn't get it because the um, generation before us, two generations and several generations voted no, no, no. And we started wanting to change things. And so changes are still happening. They're gonna happen all the time. Every generation is gonna want something different. We just have to really work hard. And today it's affordable housing because we just don't have enough places for people to live. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I really appreciate your comments. I think it's very important that uh, we are nimble enough to engage from different perspectives and views and age sets. And so I really appreciate it. I would say that uh, we are really hopeful that you are around in the next 20 years or so. And uh, we call you seasoned, not aged. So just remember that. <laughs> now uh, we get the chance to listen to Mark Smith, uh, who will give us an update from the Housing Consortium of Everidence to Homish County. Uh, Mark, I think this may be your first time on the coffee chats. I'm not sure. So welcome and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Seasoned, huh? That must mean I'm well seasoned. <laughs> That's a great way to say it. I was uh, Mark Smith. I'm the executive director of the Housing Consortium of Everett and Snohomish County. And um, I'll have some slides to show later on when we get to the Q&A because they, they, they mostly refer to that. Um, the consortium as a one person nonprofit, me, uh, I work out of my uh, office at home here. And um, I have about 50 member organizations of which about 25 are uh, affordable housing owners and operators and developers and providers, names you're familiar with, or Housing Hope, uh, the two housing authorities, uh, Mercy Housing, Catholic Housing Services, uh, the YWCA Cocoon House, um, really, almost all of the um, uh, nonprofit affordable housers in Snohomish County. And what we do collectively uh, is to um, uh, uh, address uh, affordable housing opportunities and challenges in Snohomish County. Uh, a lot of the work I do is behind the scenes uh, in support of my members, uh, but collectively, and I want to stress this, it's not just my housing consortium, but collectively uh, working with lots of stakeholders. Um, you know, we now have uh, about $50 million a year, uh, I'm sorry, $67 million a year of new money uh, coming into Snohomish County uh, for affordable housing. Uh, and that money gets leveraged uh, with federal and state money uh, to build affordable housing. Um, I, I want to say, uh, um, and I've been struggling for a way to, to say this, but I'm, I'm just going to say, you know, if you want to uh, end homelessness and end housing insecurity, because it's not just about homelessness, there's a, a gamut of issues that, that run along the housing uh, spectrum. But if you want to end homelessness and housing insecurity, we have to build more homes. 
I mean, it's as simple as that, except that it's not simple because the homes have to be appropriate with appropriate services for the population that we're trying to house. In other words, somebody who suffered a traumatic brain injury, injury at 22 in a motorcycle accident, somebody I met a few years ago, needs a different kind of housing and different kind of support services uh, than somebody uh, who is fleeing domestic violence with their children, right? And so there's a huge span uh, of different populations. And so the housing and the services need to be appropriate for that person uh, in that population. So there's a lot that goes into that uh, phrase that if we want to end homelessness um, and we want to end housing insecurity, because those are two very different things, and we need to build more homes. Um, that's the long and short of it. If you want to prevent homelessness, uh, that's way above my pay grade. And I, <laughs> I've been executive director. I just started my 12th year. Uh, and so I've sort of noodled and pondered this uh, for a number of years. Um, and if you want to prevent homelessness, it has to do with uh, ending income inequality. And it has to do with uh, living wage jobs. And it has to do with addressing family trauma. Um, and it has to do with uh, access to health care. Uh, and it has to do with all of those things that contribute to uh, people becoming homeless in the first place. And really, if you want to end, if you want to prevent homelessness or make it very temporary in a one-time deal for people, you need to build homes. You need to build a surplus of homes so that there are vacancies available when somebody becomes homeless uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so uh, I do want to put in a plug uh, because I've been told by my board of directors <laughs> that while you work great behind the scenes, you're not very good at promoting. <laughs> so uh, I will uh, invite you all to visit our website. I put my contact info in the chat. We have our annual affordable housing conference. We're returning to an in-person conference on June 9th. Um, it's uh, strategically scheduled for eight o'clock to two o'clock on a Friday. And what you do after two o'clock is on a Friday afternoon, you know, you can tell your bosses whatever you want to tell them. <laughs> but I'll have you out the door by two o'clock. I promise that. Uh, it's a great lineup of, of people, uh, speakers, breakout sessions. Uh, and our keynote speaker is uh, Fred Safston, recently retired CEO of Housing Hope. I refer to his, he has a different title for his uh, talk. I title it Fred Safstrom Unchained. So <laughs> for, for many years as CEO, uh, you know, he, he did what he needed to do. Uh, anyway, I invite you all to visit our website and uh, um, uh, thank you for putting in our, our website uh, events webpage uh, in the chat. And I will have more to say when we get to the, uh, uh, the other part of the program. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for that presentation and look forward to hearing some comments from you later. Uh, and our last presentation uh, before we go to Q&A is Chris Collier's. That's me. Um... So I am, I am not going to share the presentation I prepared for this. I thought I'd try something new for once um, and just kind of explore some of the thoughts that uh, Mayor Matsumoto Wright and Mark have shared earlier about, you know, we want to fix this. This is something that we care about, um, but really try to explore why should we care about it right now? Why should we really uh, feel like this is something that is affecting us right now, even if you know all of us in the audience perhaps are stably housed um, somewhere on that spectrum of housing stability. Um, ask yourself, do you pay for homelessness, for housing instability? Do you pay for it right now? You might say, well, there is that one tenth of one percent sales tax that the county passed two years ago. Mm, yes, I do. Actually, you've been paying for it for a lot longer and you've been paying a lot more because a hospital bed, an inpatient hospital bed in Washington state costs about $3,000 per day, $3,806 per day to be exact. <clears throat> and if you're a homeless individual with a healthcare need that puts you in an inpatient bed in a hospital, if there's no safe place to discharge you to for outpatient care, you stay there. The hospital cannot discharge you and they continue to incur that cost of that inpatient hospital bed. 
And speaking with the former executive director of the Verdant Health Commission, the story she shared with me was it's not un, it's not common, but it's not rare for people to stay in a hospital bed for 300 days over a year. So what's 3,800, 3,806 times 365? That's a lot of money, right? And when Medicare and Medicaid put their hands up and say, nope, we're not paying for that. And obviously the homeless person doesn't have the money to pay for that. Um, that becomes charity care. Your property tax bill is partly comprised of the hospital district if you're in it, right? Um, at the same time, you also contribute to the funds of your city or the county who runs a jail, the county jail and, and or the city that sends people who have been arrested for whatever crimes, petty or not, to the county jail. Mayor Matsumoto Wright can comment on that. The, you know, what the city of Mount Lake Terrace pays for people to be housed or put in the county jail. Um, an estimate from King County back in 2015 was $6,702 a month for someone to be housed in the King County Jail. At the same time, the cost for a housing unit, now you see where I'm going with this, the cost for a, a unit of housing created by the Housing Authority of Snohomish County per month over the entire lifetime of the property is an estimated $1,100 per unit per month. So you've got $3,800 a day for an inpatient hospital bed, you've got $6,700 a month for a jail cell, and you've got $1,100 a month for a housing unit. You already pay for that hospital bed, if it's charity care, and for that jail cell. So you're already, you've already been paying a lot for this. Um, and that's something to keep in mind as we talk about this is, you know, the state, for example, as Mark's later going to talk about um, recent action down in Olympia, as we think about, well, why did the state do this? You know, you can, you can if you want to. One of the reasons that the state did this is because, you know, took all this action on housing is because it's economically stupid to leave this issue unaddressed and in the hands of healthcare and law enforcement, especially when housing can be a successful intervention for for things that might otherwise, you know, allow people to do preventative healthcare maintenance before they end up in the emergency room and they have no place to go. So it's economically sensible to have a place for people to stay, to have a place for, to discharge people to. Um, and there's so much more, but that's just something that I wanted to share with you is kind of like, oh, I do pay for this already. Each and every one of us pays for this already. Furthermore, on the moving away from homelessness, talking about the private market kind of just the broader broader society in general, the average property tax per acre paid per acre by a single family home in Snohomish County. So if you take if you make one acre of single family homes, the average single family home, you get five hundred and forty nine thousand dollars per acre of single family homes. Meanwhile, townhomes in Snohomish County, if you have one acre of townhomes, you get five point seven million dollars of property tax per acre with townhomes, just townhomes, not condominiums, not duplexes and stuff like that, just townhomes. So 570, what'd I say, $550,000, and then $5.7 million. And the way, the reason I mention this is because the way our, our property tax bill works is the more people you have sharing the load, the less your property tax bill is. So the more people that you have sharing that, whatever your prop, the tax bill is for the city, the county, the state, the lower your property taxes go. So for example, if I looked at an example of um, a very rundown home in the city of Stahomish, looking at you, Mayor Redmond, and I looked at that home, and then I took a duplex condominium that I found in Monroe. It was about 20 years old, and I said, well, what happens if I replace that use of that old single family home with these two units? Everybody's property tax bill in the city of Stahomish goes down by about 75 cents a year. Now that's not much, 75 cents a year isn't, you know, you wouldn't even stop to pick that up off the sidewalk, but that's only two units. You know, let's start talking about the 300,000 housing units that we have in Snohomish County. Let's start working at that level. That really starts making an impact. Um, and that's another reason that it's really worthwhile to consider this and to say, hey, thanks state for helping us out, for giving us a little relief because that's gonna lo ultimately lower your property tax bill, both in reducing charity and jail costs charity care and jail costs, and also just because you have more homes to go around. 
And of course, the economic implications that uh, Mayor Matsumoto men right, mentioned at the top, now people can live closer to where they work. Just a quick closing point. 93% uh, of the city of Linwood's workforce does not live in the city. I think I shared that the last time I spoke at Economic Alliance. That is true for Snohomish. 92% of the city of Snohomish's workforce does not live in the city. Um, and there's so much more that housing drives your workforce away. If you feel like, oh, I can't hire people. Oh, it's really hard to retain people. Oh, people don't arrive on time because of traffic. You know, you're really looking at the second order impact of housing unaffordability and people living further and further and further away. Um, and the roads aren't getting much wider, and they shouldn't. So that's, I'll leave it there. Um, just trying to set up some thoughts uh, for you on why housing really is something that affects you day to day. Um, and if you want the presentation that I decided not to share, just let me know. I've got sources for all the numbers that I uh, just vomited at you. So. All right. Thank you, Chris, as well. And uh, I know people will be uh, excited to get a copy of that presentation as well. Let's dive into some questions. And uh, we'll just start off with uh, one from uh, the governor's office. Uh, governor Inslee recently signed a 10 uh, housing bills into law. Uh, could you walk our viewers through some of those bills and how they impact them and our communities? Yeah, I'd love to take a stab at this. If I could uh, share my screen here. So, um, yeah, that's, oops. Okay. There we go. Nope. There we go. Nope. All right. <laughs> Uh, why doesn't somebody else jump in while I get my uh, slide? Oh, you're fine. You're fine. I think you're you're one slide away. But well, I'm not sure what I did, but mm -hmm. yeah, we can reset. I'll go to another question. And we'll come back to that one. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, tied to this is what would you say to members of the community who are worried that opening all single-family neighborhoods to duplexes and triplexes? Uh, will diminish the character of the community. So, um, Mayor, would you start off and Chris maybe chime in after that? Well, I think a lot of people are scared uh, with any kind of change, and they, they think that more than one unit in a neighborhood is going to look really different because um, architectural styles have changed. But in reality, if you look at the old neighborhoods before um, before the suburbs came along, like in Capitol Hill and, and so forth, you're gonna see a lot of um, houses that all look alike and be surprised that many of them are duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and so forth. And um, a regular, it's, let's just take a split level home as an example. That is a perfect duplex. Very, very few changes need to be made in, uh, when making um, a split level into uh, two units. But also you, get a, you have a 3,000 square foot, three car garage, three bedroom or four bedroom house. And uh, some of the bedrooms are on different levels and so forth. Um, that can be a perfect duplex or triplex. Mm -hmm. uh, with very, very few changes. And it just looks like a house from the outside, like a regular house. Other people are, are, are worried that more um, cars are going to come in um, because you have more people living there. A family of four, when once your kids start growing up and having their own cars, will have four or more cars. And so a duplex is not going to have any more cars than uh, your family that's living there right now. So... That's my two cents. Thanks. And Chris? Yeah, you know, the, the thing that House Bill 1110 that Mark's going to touch on in a minute um, really focused on is it's in the bill, it's even in the language, is that from the outside, a middle, house, a middle density housing uh, unit structure should look substantially the same as a current single family home. It should be the same approximate footprint. It should be the same approximate height. Um, you know, thinking that middle housing is something like a mid-rise apartment 
is you know dispurious to the max. There is no basis in fact for that at all. Um, so that's the first thing: is middle housing is intended to be take your 2,800 square foot single family home and just divide up the interior a little bit. The exterior remains the same. Um, and Mayor Matsumoto Wright already touched on transit. But one thing I'll add is um, the emphasis of housing density is that uh, it should go next to transit so that people have the option to live with one car, live with no cars. Um, and also, also, we're not outlawing single family homes. We're not prohibiting that. We're simply allowing people to have a choice for people to choose and development to choose um, you know, how we can best serve, serve people's needs. So, because right now people, well, one argument I heard against 1110 was, well, but this is a one size fits all solution. Really? Because 80% of the residential land area in Snohomish County is currently exclusively zoned for single family detached homes. That to me is a one size fits all solution. And we're trying to break that up a little bit. We're trying to allow neighborhoods to change and grow and meet the needs of the communities they serve that live there or will live there gradually instead of locking them in time for decades and decades and decades and saying, well, gosh, why is that having an impact on society? Um, you know, it's really, there's a lot to recommend to this. Um, so I'll stop there before I, I know we have other questions. No, great, great. Uh, Mark, would you like to chime in while you dive into the first question as well? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And I apologize for before. Um, I know Jim Dean is on the call here. He's on my board. And um, I swear, Jim, I practiced this ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> Me and technology, you know. Uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, take a step back for a minute. Um, here are some of the uh, bills uh, that the governor has signed that are related to housing. And, and this is just some of them. And I want to make sure everybody understands that the housing consortium really works on affordable housing, meaning sort of up to 60% of AMI. So it's really housing that the private market uh, uh, really can't build uh, without public subsidy uh, because they can't go to the bank, get a loan, um, you know, build the building and charge uh, rents or prices high enough to pay back their loan and make a profit, which they they need to be able to do, uh, and low enough for people, uh, you know, with less than 60% of AMI income can afford. Uh, so that's where the nonprofit affordable housing uh, industry comes in. Uh, rest assured, I'm not going to go through all of these bills, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to let you know that there's a whole lot involved um, in assisting uh, the construction and the maintenance and operation of affordable housing, whether that is a single family home or multifamily units. Uh, the two bills that I do want to touch on are in green. Um, and the most important are the budgets uh, and then HB 1110, which we just already started to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to touch on the budget real quickly, because honestly, Building affordable housing, you have to have the funding to do it. You got to follow the money. And that's what I, uh, you know, that's part of my job is to increase uh, the amount of money available for affordable housing. So in this last legislative session, uh, there's 400 million uh, to the housing trust fund. And if you're not familiar with the housing trust fund, it's the largest source of funding uh, for non-market affordable housing uh, by the state. Um, and that gets combined with other uh, funds uh, and leveraged with other funds uh, to build affordable housing. Now, you should know that that 400 million, while it may sound like a lot, uh, it's, it's not uh, compared to the need. And it is a competitive application process to access those funds. Uh, you don't just get to ask for it. You have to compete with, uh, you know, not, uh, with uh, affordable housers uh, statewide. And that fund is always oversubscribed. Uh, another piece of the budget that's really exciting is 60 million to something called the Connecting Housing to Infrastructure Program to allow cities to apply for grants or low interest loans uh, to help build out their infrastructure uh, to connect affordable housing. Uh, there's 22 million, there's actually 221 million in the Behavioral Health Community Capacity Grants, but 22 million of that is coming to Snohomish County uh, organizations. Uh, 40 million in a land acquisition program by the Washington State Housing Finance Commission, 
with 50 million additional uh, from Microsoft, and I think we'll get to that later. Uh, 5 million for something called the landlord mitigation account, which is there if a landlord, a private market landlord, uh, or a nonprofit landlord agrees to house, um, you know, some of our more difficult population and their unit gets damaged, then they can apply for mitigation funds uh, to help restore that unit. Uh, 5 million for the Washington Youth and Families Fund, which is specifically to address um, uh, yeah, youth homelessness. And then something that, you know, often goes unremarked, but all of the frontline service providers, they do work that, quite frankly, I couldn't do on a day-to-day -day basis, meeting with people, trying to help them. And so this uh, state put in a 6% increase in the allowed administrative fee uh, in homeless service provider contracts. So really, this year, the most important bill that was passed, or bills, I should say, were the capital budget and the operating budget. There's a lot more in both of these budgets. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to talk more about them. Um, and then to get to HB 1110, and thanks to Chris Collier for uh, his uh, help on this and, and verifying some of this information. Uh, Chris does amazing work over at the Alliance for Housing Affordability. Um, but this is the, the bill, and I want to reiterate what uh, Chris said uh, that this doesn't require cities to do anything other than put in code uh, the following authorizations. In other words, it doesn't require cities to build anything. It doesn't require cities to, um, you know, uh, force builders to build anything in single family lots. What it does is require cities to uh, change their codes uh, so that it authorizes um, uh, slightly higher densities on single family residential land. And this information, I know it's a little bit dense. Uh, it's also in the bill, uh, but different densities apply to different population uh, sized cities. And, and I've got that in here. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these. What I will say is that um, it, it's not going to happen uh, overnight. <laughs> There's a lot that goes into a builder uh, deciding what to build on a, on a particular piece of property, and it's got to pencil out for them. Uh, so I would be very surprised if you saw very much movement on this uh, in the next couple of years until this type of housing became more, I guess, palatable to people. Um, what I will say about the fear, uh, it's funny, we just had our house painted. I live in a single family home. We just had our house painter and the painter, not knowing what I do, was complaining about this bill. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we talked about it a bit and he was a, he was a really funny guy. <laughs> and so, um, uh, but uh, sorry, my point is, uh, I have a little different take on this. I lived in Japan for 13 years, owned a home there. Uh, and, you know, we don't have a clue what density is. And what I came to understand about density is that it creates community. And uh, sociologists are now talking about how there's an epidemic of loneliness uh, in America, primarily because of COVID, but it predates COVID. It's also social media. And what density does is um, uh, create community in the sense that you have more people living in a certain area than you get more mom and pop shops who are servicing those areas. And you start to run into your neighbors, just casual acquaintances. You know, right now I know the people on either side of me and the people across the street, uh, but down the road, no, I don't know who they are. I mean, I know them to recognize them. I don't know their names. I don't know how many kids they have, that kind of stuff. Uh, but when you're running into people um, on a regular basis at the local shops, you start to create those connections. Uh, not, not necessarily friendships, but just connections and those day-to-day -day interactions that help alleviate some of that loneliness, but they create ties and they create that kind of Mayberry effect that. Uh, you know, some people of my age uh, often say they want. So I would say that the, the, the fear is understandable. Everybody, you know, better the devil we know than the one we don't. And the devil we know is really high-priced housing. And the devil we don't know is in 
uh, increased densities. Uh, so it's better to, uh, you know, stay with the devil we know. Well, um, Mark, let me ask you and the panelists a question on that. Uh, if people are uh, dealing with the devil we know, which is high price housing, uh, what's the impact of, of, of sticking with that uh, proverbial devil? Uh, Chris looks like he's ready to dive in. <laughs> um, so I hope most people on this call are like, yeah, we should do something about that housing thing. That's that matters just for its own for its own reasons. Um, but let's hypothetically say someone's in the audience saying, ah, this is a bunch of crap. I don't care about housing and no one else should either. But I care about the environment. Let's just take that one right by itself. You remember I mentioned 93 percent of Linwood's workforce doesn't live there. Uh, about 37% of the city's workforce drives over 30 minutes to reach work. Um, in the city of Everett, just recalling off the top of my head, I was looking at this yesterday, about 9,000 pe 9, people every day commute to Everett for longer than 80 to 90 minutes. 89, 90 minutes or more, excuse me. 9,000 people every day, that's each way, right? Think about that, the number of minutes in, in years. Right, every single day, the number of years that you spend on the road cumulatively just to get to work, that has a vast environmental impact. So if you don't care about housing um, and you say, we can just maintain the status quo, but you care about the environment, this issue is tanking anything that you try to do to protect and preserve the environment. So that right there, and we can go on to healthcare, education, health, um, you know, more and more and more, every, you know, everything relates to housing. What happens? whether or not you have a house very very little step aside for mayor metz on the right yes mayor oh yes um if we continue to just keep single house single family housing the way it is without changing anything we're going to run out of housing because our population is going to grow with from within and people are moving in uh, we have good jobs here and so people are wanting to move here for our jobs, um, but we are going to run out of housing and then we're gonna have to start um, doubling up. And so you, shared housing and, and all of that. So what's the difference between that and just getting a duplex or a triplex in there? I hear you. And, and who wants to, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I have family visit, it's only for a short period of time. So imagine having a whole another family living with you. I, I'm one of those folks that like a little bit of my private space, but um, go ahead, Chris. The thing I want to jump in with too is, you know, what what's going to happen if we continue um, on, the, on the course we're in? We're already seeing that. You know, the, my favorite worst story is from the town of Darrington, and the superintendent um, up there in the Darrington School District who shared a story of people living in a tent in someone's backyard because there's nowhere else for them to go. That is their permanent housing solution is a tent with an extension cord running out to it in the, someone's backyard in Darrington, in and around the town of Darrington. You know, that's it. And you might think, well, Darrington, that's really far away. Yes, it is. But that, you know, that's how far this issue has reached it is all the way up to the North County line in Darrington and Stanwood. And further still, you know, that is the status quo. And furthermore, you know, do, would you like your kids to be able to play with Judge Smith's kids, not Mark Smith, uh, Judge, other Judge Smith? Um, you know, think about the life altering impact that if you're living, you know, that Mark mentioned, of you know, ha that may very effect of uh, knowing your neighbors, just having that connection, you know, then your kids go and play with those kids. Imagine the life altering impact if the kids are playing with are the judge's kids the you know, finance director's kids, the, you know, this kids that might give them that course in life, that, that experience that really sparks something new and great in your kids. We don't have that anymore because the status quo is preventing us from mixing occupations together. It's only allowing the very top, top, top earners to actually own anywhere in our current neighborhoods. Only, recalling from memory, 7.8% of the central Puget Sound's workforce can buy in Snohomish County on a single income. 7.8% of, let's see, how many millions of people work in the three county region, King, Snohomish, and Pierce? Um, only 7.8% of them can buy in Snohomish County. Like, that's, you know, think about all the occupations and experiences that your, you and your kids will miss 
because they can't interact with those people as their neighbors anymore. I mean, you can't quantify that, but that sucks. That makes me upset, and that's why I keep doing this work, and I get so enthusiastic. Sorry. Thank you, Mark. I know there's a question that we have here, and then we'll get to some of the questions in the chat. Um, I think asking a, a, an additional question here might be, as part of the governor's 2023-2025 uh, operating and capital budgets, Microsoft's office providing $50 million for land acquisition, as you mentioned in your PowerPoint slide. What are some of the other ways that private sector uh, folks can help to solve the affordable housing uh, problem? Well, I'll take a run at this. <laughs> um, uh, first, first of all, it's, it's important to note that that 50 million that Microsoft is pledging is for six East Side, King County East Side cities only. Um, it's not statewide. It's not county, King County wide, or anything like that. So while it's it's a great uh, uh, piece of money. Uh, you know, it's it's really kind of a drop in the bucket bucket. And I don't mean to minimize what they're doing because a corporation is giving 50 million dollars. That's that's a significant thing. Right. But um, there are very few Microsofts uh, that are able to do that. Uh, and uh, certainly only really one comes to mind out here in Snohomish County. Um, uh, and and so. So the question is, what what other things can uh, the private market do? Um, when you talk about affordable housing for extremely low income and very low income households, um, it's very difficult for the private market uh, to involve themselves in that area. Uh, things that they could do is support local efforts to um, create uh, improvement districts, um, like they're doing at the Everett Station uh, District Alliance, um, and that will include uh, affordable, affordable housing. Um, they can um, certainly um, contribute uh, funding to uh, projects that are underway, you know, that, that uh, houses are building. But there isn't a there isn't an easy or quick answer uh, to that, quite frankly. I, I feel like my answer isn't very adequate, but that's because it's a difficult question. Well, uh, this mayor, did you want to chime in? Well, I I, I just wanted to add something. Um, um, the bills, um, if I could, if I could, that kind of segues into some of this stuff. The um, one of the bills was on. Um, getting condos built, changing the condo rules and everything. Because if you think about it, how many single family homes today, as you drive by neighborhoods, are occupied by one person? And that one person would love to move and sell their house if they had someplace to move to. But the majority of the, them do not have anywhere to move to. And that would be in the old days, they would move to a nice condominium. We're talking about affordable housing today, but we're talking about housing in general. And if they could move to a nice condominium that had an elevator, not a three-story uh, townhome with an, you know, uh, with all those steps, then they they probably would sell their single-family home, which then will make room for another family to move into, and and so on and so forth. And how many thousands? of homes like that are there out there. So I think that the builders, I, you know, I don't know why it is, I know it was a, a lot of difficult laws and so forth that was preventing them from building condominiums, but we're, you know, I don't know when we're gonna get to the point where it's gonna be absolutely um, easy and money-making to make condominiums, but those are needed to get the, um, inventory up for single family homes and then the single family homes can then turn into other things later on uh, into duplexes, the easiest thing to turn them into uh, add ADUs and so forth. Thanks. All right, and we're gonna try to get to a few more of these uh, chat questions if you all don't mind. I think there was a question asked about 
whether or not uh, some of the problem uh, with uh, affordability being uh, the folks looking not being able to uh, find the right resources or not knowing where to look. So uh, do any of you have any thoughts on that, that question? In the chat, which is um, all, our, all our resources that you could navigate someone to are deeply oversubscribed. Um, using, you know, I get to sit inside the housing authority and know what they do every day. Um, the shortest wait list at the housing authority is five years. That's for a senior or disabled. If you have a senior or disabled family member, you only, only have to wait for five years to get a voucher on average. Um, for the general voucher pool, it was 10 years in the post-recession era, um, and that's changed a little bit. So um, just final point, um, also inside the housing authority, some, uh, a coworker of mine was working to get someone uh, addiction treatment. They said, I am ready to be sober. I'm ready to go. I got to go now. The place, the soonest they could get someone to treatment was, could you wait for four weeks? You know, you, can, you sometimes there's a little nook of unused resources, but generally speaking, they're deeply oversubscribed. Yeah, and I would just reinforce what Chris said. It's it, it's not an issue of trying to find the resources. It's an issue of there aren't enough resources. There isn't enough housing, there aren't enough treatment slots, uh, there aren't enough mental health beds, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, that's really the issue. Okay, Mayor? Oh, well, I agree with, with all of them. Um, the supporting services, we need, sorry about this. <laughs> uh, uh, we just need more. Um, and 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 also when we when we try to build more, we get resistance from the the community. So uh, again, we need to change a lot of different things. And um, I, I know that the community um, likes what they have right now. But mm -hmm. uh, how we're going to make things better? How we're going to have anything happen if we just don't start doing something? Right. Right. Um, I, I know there's a question that we have as well that ties into a chat question about housing afford affordability actually being a national issue. And uh, honestly, I probably would say that it's probably a global issue. Uh, and so have you all seen any uh, successful models or initiatives in areas of the country that might effectively be used here to address our housing unaffordability? Well, <laughs> I think we're all hesitating, although I shouldn't speak for them. It, it partly depends on how you define successful, right? There are an incredible number of successful models dealing with a specific population, right? Uh, for example, the, the state of uh, Utah had a strong drive to house veterans and house chronically homeless, and they were very successful in doing that. But it was at the expense, you know, five, six years later, we find out it's at the expense of all the other populations uh, that need housing. Uh, so there isn't a successful model that has ended homelessness or ended housing insecurity because the problem is so large. But there are a number of successful models for specific populations and specific initiatives. Uh, anyone else? I would agree. Um, I think part of the part of the you know national international scope of this, especially as we go international, is you know we can talk about other countries that have different approaches, but you know those are really fundamental, fundamentally culturally different approaches. You know, Mark uh, mentioned living in Japan. Uh, Mayor Matsumoto Wright can chip in on that as well. Um, there's also Vienna, Austria, which is very different. Sixty percent of the housing in Vienna is owned by the government, and Vienna is a nice place to live. But when you say that to, you know, a true red-blooded American, 60% of the housing is owned by the government, people would, you know, <gasps> um, so we can talk about that internet, those international examples, but recognizing we're going to trip right out of the starting gate with some cultural uh, differences of opinion. And nationally, you know, I honestly, I don't think that we do have a great example of a solution because it is a national issue. Um, Washington State is the third in between 2012 and 2016. Washington State was the third highest state to receive in, uh, domestic migrants. That's people moving from a state of a, a different American state to somewhere else. 
Uh, the other two top states were Florida and Texas in that order. Um, and that hasn't slowed down because there's, as Mayor Matsumoto right mentioned, there's economic opportunity here. Um, there's nice climate. You know, it's not scorching hot. We're not burning down. We don't have tornadoes. We don't have hurricanes. Um, there's a lot to recommend here, and people continue to come here for the economic opportunity and the climate and a variety of other things. Um, and so I often ponder, you know, why isn't this a congressional issue? Why aren't both parties keenly interested in this? Democrats from the coastal states and Republicans from the Midwest states really interested in this because it's both to their benefit, right? Because Republican Congress people should be just hot to trot on economic reinvestment in their states and bringing people there and keeping people there instead of, you know, just picking up stakes and leaving. And yet, we aren't seeing a lot of congressional action on that. And so Washington state and the coastal states are kind of left to carry it for the Midwestern states, like people that might move here from Nebraska, for example. <laughs> uh, Mayor, did you want to chime in? No, I, I, I just want to just agree with, with everybody. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of examples, um, and I don't know of any recent ones, but I know that there are some successes out there. But um, the, we're all still struggling. We're also trying to figure out what to do and how to do things better. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, you know, there's so many programs. I think Mark and Chris, you were alluding to them. Uh, we think of HUD, how many programs tie under HUD? There's thousands of them. Uh, USDA, hundreds of them. Uh, you can take, think of low-income housing tax credits. You can think of uh, the affordable uh, housing programs that are across the country. You can think of the workforce housing uh, pilot projects that have happened across the country. Uh, you can think of incentive-based uh, TIF uh, or tax increment finance housing projects that have happened. There's tons of, of programs out there, uh, but I think what the panelists are alluding to is that um, it's not a catch-all for any community or state, and, and so it really has to be um, uh, woven out of uh, the community, uh, the business community being a part of it, the private investors, and land is always um, an issue. And so I appreciate you all tackling that question, which was not a fair one to ask. Uh, uh, and last but not least, I think we have some comments in here. I want to make sure that I give you a little bit of time to give kind of final parting thoughts. Um, but I, I think each of you have put your contact information in the chat. Uh, folks who are asking uh, leading questions, please engage directly. Uh, obviously, uh, the waiting list for some of these programs uh, are outstandingly long. Um, but I, I'll just say again, this is kind of a space that I um, am passionate about because I think, as Mark and I talked about earlier, the connection between uh, affordable housing and a talented and existing and retained workforce, uh, thriving businesses that are landed, quality of life, this is all tied to what is a universal uh, right for all of us to, to have adequate housing. I think Darren King's story that Chris mentioned is uh, heart-wrenching uh, and to realize that that's just you know the tip of the iceberg there are many of families that you have seen who are gainfully employed who are, are out on the streets or living in different uh, places I know too well what that's like to travel from home to home uh, to neighbors looking for places to stay um, and waiting for that Section 8 housing, as someone mentioned in the chat, um, where I'm a product of as well. So I, I want to appreciate all of you being willing to share um, some thoughts here. So with the last few moments that we have, I'm going to give you each uh, a minute or two, a couple minutes to kind of give your, your final thoughts. Um, and if, there, if you want to address a question in the chat, that's, that's great. Um, but please connect us to um, our economic development. Uh, efforts, um, our community as a whole. And so, Mayor, you have the uh, the platform to start. Oh, <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I think this is a very, very um, important issue that we need to keep working on. Um, we really do. It's hard to change people's mind, especially when they're scared. And uh, but we need to look at the future. And um, we, when we listen to the younger generation 
um, baby boomer generation is talking about, we need our car. We absolutely need our car. And they're not uh, hearing that the, the new generation, the younger generation is saying, well, I can just Uber or I can do this, you know, and so forth. Um, so I really don't need a car, but I might rent a car if I really need one. Um, and so if we didn't have um, the mandatory parking in some of our um, units that we need to build, um, it, we could build more housing and less uh, parking near transit, which is what it's all about. But we have so much resistance from so many people. And, um, and I think a lot of it is fear, but hopefully we can just start um, changing things. Thank you. Thank you, and, and Mark? Yeah, um, I guess I'm often the uh, uh, bringer of doom and gloom. <laughs> and so uh, along with, yeah, along with Chris, because <laughs> people, and I'm no different, people want a magic wand about how to solve an issue. And um, what I want to say is don't get overwhelmed uh, that there are um, uh, measures that we can take that we keep plugging along. I like to equate it to, I was on the Linwood City Council for eight years. And every year we had a budget for streets, right? Just because we paved one street doesn't mean we stop paving streets, right? It's an ongoing issue that you continue to address while holding on to your vision for the future of your city, of your county, of your state. Um, so, and I'm happy to talk to anybody at any time about what different jurisdictions can do. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate having you here. Looking forward to having a cup of coffee with you in the future. Um, Chris, final words. Okay, final word. Um, when did this all start? We ask ourselves. When you know, let's go back to the root. Um, let me ask you this: What did Mount Lake Terrace and Everett look like before World War II? Right? What were they like? What were those cities like? Because the post World War II era is what we're living in the final. We're living in the final part of the post World War II era of suburban expansion, in my opinion. You know, if we want to point to when did this all start, let's look at that when we had that suburban explosion and single family home became just the cultural norm. And to change that goes against our cultural norms. That's what we're fighting against, right? Not to say that we have to, there was a reason that happened back then, but there's a reason to do something new now. And, you know, Mount Lake Terrace, the reason I asked that kind of weird question at the top is Mount Lake Terrace looked a lot different back in 1940. Ever looked a lot different before the war, right? Um, what do you think people then said about that? You know, things, cities can look different. It's okay because we appreciate what they look like now and we can appreciate and guide what they look like tomorrow to the betterment of all. And it's to all of our interests. And that's what I've tried to close with today is that it's really in all of our interests, whether you care about money and property taxes and finances and budgets, whether you care about the environment, healthcare, uh, social issues, so on and so forth, you know, whatever you care about, it all comes back to housing. Yeah. And we can change. None of this is a physical law of the universe, like mm -hmm. one plus one equals two. You know, we can, we control what housing can look like and what housing can be, and we have examples of that changing. Um, you know, and right now, the post-war era norm for housing, I really think, is coming to an end. We're reaching the end of the music, and we've got to spring to something new. We've got to innovate and do something new. And just like the post-war era, the suburban expansion really ignited the economy of America with, you know, everyone owning a home, things like that, filling up with furniture, yada, yada, you know, that awaits us when we're ready to take that step. You know, that economic engine awaits us when we are ready to take that step in Snohomish County and Washington and America. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you all for uh, some amazing comments and uh, engagement here. Uh, it looks like Mayor uh, Redmond is not going to co-sign on the doom and gloom uh, brothers, uh, so you you all will have to find a different name. Uh, I do think that today has been an amazing uh, conversation about housing. I think it's near and dear to all of our hearts um, because uh, it is not, as Mark mentioned, siloed out by itself. Um, it is uh, tied to every piece of uh, community infrastructure that we think is necessary to sustain ourselves. And so uh, in each of your communities, uh, you can uh, be independent in your efforts, but if we collectively find a way to create uh, uh, incentive or investment funds 
uh, for affordable or workforce housing collectively as a county and, and region, uh, we can do better uh, nimble work uh, that is not tied to some restriction. And so I, I think of that as, as one uh, parting thought. Additionally, we know we have cross laminated timber, 3D print housing, we have uh, container homes and all of these different pieces. But I think what I'm, at, I'm going to ask each of our business leaders uh, and those of you on this call to think about is, um, are we doing enough in, in our independent spaces? Are we merging our thoughts uh, tied to housing with business and attraction and all of those things? When we have the conversation about workforce, housing should be right behind it. When we have a conversation about attracting business, housing should be right behind it. When we have a conversation about quality of life, housing should be right behind it. So I thank uh, our panelists today, uh, Mark Smith, uh, Mayor Matsumoto Wright, uh, Chris Collier, and all of you folks, we're going to go to, I do not know if, oh, there we are. Uh, we do have something going on this week. It is on May 25th. It is from 4 to 6 uh, p.m. Elemental Cider is going to have the Economic Alliance in Homish County and Stilly Valley Chamber of Commerce, uh, Chamber Partners After Hours. So if you wanna engage more on, on these things that we call uh, important and near and dear to our hearts, that is where you go um, to make some connections uh, this week. And following that, I believe we have our public officials reception and legislative wrap up, uh, which will be led by uh, Rashma Argawal uh, from our team here. It's June 8th from 4 to 7 p.m. at Hotel Indigo uh, in Everett. And again, this is going to be presented by the Boeing Company. So if you're looking to engage with the dignitaries and talk about housing and business and all of those elements, please show up there. Um, additionally, I want to thank you all for joining us. I want us to go to our gallery screen. And folks, you know how we do it. If you have your water, coffee, or whatever beverage it is, fruit juice, please raise those cups. Uh, this is in solidarity for today and this week and beyond in Snohomish County. Uh, thank you to our housing uh, experts. Have a great day, folks. Take care.